Hi, welcome back to Coding Matters. My name's Andrew, and I'm delighted to be joined by Associate Professor Krish Sundararajan, who's the Director of Intensive Care at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Thanks for joining us, Krish. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And we'll be talking about intensive care documentation today. So if you're new to clinical coding and you're thinking, why should I watch this video? What's it about? Clinical coding is a way that we measure activity in a hospital level. And we can measure activity in lots of different ways, but most of these series we talk about inpatient admissions. And how do we measure complexity? How do we measure the variety of conditions that come through? And that's super relevant to intensive care, where there is a very high level of complexity and a lot of patients coming through. So coding is a way that we can distill down to a principal diagnosis, which is in retrospect, the reason they came to hospital. So someone might come to hospital with chest pain that turns out that they're actually having a pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolism becomes their primary diagnosis or their principal diagnosis. and They get coded into that particular diagnostic group. And then how severe they are. Someone might come to ED and get admitted to AMU overnight for observation. They don't have hypoxia and they're able to go home on a Pixaban the next day. Someone else might come with a saddle PE where they are having uh, right ventricular strain, they're having some fluid overload from right heart failure, and they have quite severe type one respiratory failure requiring high flow oxygen. And they're gonna come to intensive care here for maybe 48 hours whilst they get better, and maybe even be considered for thrombolysis. You can see those two ends of the spectrum for the same condition uh, really represent vastly different complexity and vastly different investment of resources. And so we use our coding to determine the amount of funding and the way that we measure our performance with the different complexity of cases. So that's clinical coding in a nutshell. And you can see on this diagram, apart from the principal diagnosis, the secondary diagnoses, the complications, the procedures and comorbidities, all go in to contribute uh, an accurate code. And there are clinical coders who sit in an office and this is what they do all day, every day. They're trained to look through our documentation, um, admission notes, discharge, ward round notes, consults, everything, and try and get the best, uh, most accurate code that will reflect that patient's journey and that will be used for funding and performance and other elements. There are three elements in the recipe of a code and that is to have some kind of a clinical assessment, whether that's history, examination, test results, or all of the above, combined with a diagnostic statement where you actually say, this is the diagnosis, this is my impression. And that can't just be a, a syndrome or symptoms, it needs to be a specific diagnosis. And that's probably the area that most of us doctors fall down on and then combined with some kind of intervention. Because if you have a diagnosis, but you don't need to do anything about it, then why do they need to be in hospital? Mm -hmm. uh, so the care plan there has to be uh, documented as well. Got those three, you can get a code. In today's video with intensive care, we're gonna go through three main areas. One, we're gonna talk about why intensive care is such a unique area when it comes to documentation. We're gonna talk about the basic principles of being explicit, specific, relational, and clear which apply to every area in the hospital, but um, are particularly relevant to intensive care. And then we're gonna look through our top five under-documented conditions specifically for intensive care. Well, let's start, Krish, how do you see, as a manager, as someone who's been involved in leadership for some time, what do you see as the value of coding and, and good quality documentation? Thank you, Andrew. I think it's pivotal that we add value to what we're doing in all shapes and forms and more importantly this is a low-hanging fruit mm. it's important for us to understand that uh, you know it is very clear from what we have seen that we can do better in this space and the ICU is unique as you said because we have patients who are essentially coming here as the final common pathway after mm. having been to multiple specialities either it be medical or surgical and because it is the distilling pl plot um, of what happens there it is important for us uh, to ensure that you know what we code encapsulates everything that they have received. And for us, it is very important that we are explicit and we are specific in what we document, but also at the same time make that connection as to why it happened in the first instance. And also finally make it very clear to anyone who is going to look into that, that they are not actually miscalculating or speculating because you know we have a lot of syndromes. Mm. You know, we may or may not own many diseases, but we, we own a lot of syndromes and complexes. Absolutely. And as a consequence, you know, there is too many things that can you know, happen behind each syndrome, as you are well, well aware. Yeah. Mm, well said. Um, I was fortunate to spend a year in intensive care here at the Royal Adelaide as part of my physician training. And I learned a lot uh, from being here. And it was a really interesting contrast um, from my time on the wards to time in a critical care specialty. So some things specific to um, intensive care is the ICU is always an escalation of care. 
And I didn't realize until I started encoding that that specific phrase is actually very valuable. So if a patient requires escalation of care, that's something that can be measured and that we can devote resources to in the bigger picture. So it's really important that we're making that clear. And that escalation of care principle could be as much as someone on the ward requiring a one-to-one -one nurse, that's an escalation of care, or them requiring telemetry in a CCU environment, that's an escalation of care. And it doesn't get much more escalated than coming to intensive care mm. or, or high dependency unit. Patients who come to intensive care, by definition, are high complexity. Mm. They, there are a number of levels of complexity with most codes. Uh, most of them have two or three, some have four levels. So by definition, you're not gonna be the most basic, but our documentation within ICU can be the difference between that medium, high, or very high complexity. And so we really wanna make sure we're documenting to support that. And intensive care also has very specific interventions that are very rarely used outside of intensive care, other than perhaps anaesthetics is probably the next most common area. So using uh, vasopressors, intubation and ventilation, as well as a lot of the neurologic monitoring, um, dialysis that's provided, as well as more extreme methods like ECMO to preserve life, are very specific to ICU and being able to name what that is and why we're using it and what the specific in indication to start that was is really valuable when we're trying to measure the use uh, and effective use of these very high cost interventions. Wouldn't you say, Chris? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, complexity is one, the acuity and severity is the other one as well. So all these things go hand in hand, they're part mm. of the continuum. But more importantly, I think the complexity wise, you know, a patient could be, you know, self ventilating on minimal supports from a vasopressor point of view, and in a matter of a few minutes can actually deteriorate to the point that the patient might be requiring dialysis or could have a neurological deterioration to the point that they might be, you know, required to have artificial life support commenced. Mm. So these things change um, as a matter of fact, and that's why it is important that every time it happens, things are very dynamic and we, you know, we quantify them accurately. Yeah. yeah. Um, and understandably, uh, if you're a critical care uh, staff member, trainee or consultant, you're very busy and your patients are very sick and they need a lot of your attention. And so it's easy for documentation to maybe fall by the wayside a bit. Mm. But if we really want the best for our patients and we're really trying to run an effective high quality unit, we need to make that time to prioritise documentation so that we can continue to fund good staffing, good facilities, great equipment and great training. Uh, and so every little bit of that documentation that you invest, even those discussions of consults with other teams and updates to family members that sometimes don't get documented, those things all uh, form the bigger picture of the patient's journey and are valuable uses of time. So um, thank you in advance for, for that documentation. And lastly, as I've alluded to, whenever we're doing some of these interventions or investigations, uh, we need to really relate them to a specific diagnosis, which is particularly important in ICU because as we've discussed already, people often come with multiple problems or they come with one big problem and very quickly multiple complications or uh, associated conditions are identified. Being able to link those specific interventions to those individual conditions is so important with capturing complexity. So this is general principles of documentation. We want to be as explicit as possible, and that means using diagnostic terminology. So examples of that would be if you're just writing hemoglobin 66 transfused red cells, there's no diagnostic statement there. That's a result and a plan. So we've missed that core element of saying that there is anemia. And then we want to be as specific as possible, and that is in terms of the classification and causes and severity. And so again, with the anemia, being specific means anemia due to whatever condition that is actually causing it. Is it hemorrhage? Is it myelosuppression from sepsis? Is it myelosuppression from chemotherapy because it's a transplant patient? Whatever it is, always looking at what's the relationship between these conditions, which is the next point, being relational. So often one condition will have multiple complications, pneumonia with type one respiratory failure, pneumonia with delirium, pneumonia with septic shock, those things all require high level interventions like vasopressors, like uh, dialysis, like non-invasive ventilation. So linking those things are going non-invasive ventilation for the type one respiratory failure due to the pneumonia, that relationship being really clear is the best way to capture complexity. And lastly, we wanna be as clear as possible, and this is not just intensive care, it's everywhere, especially in Australia, we're the highest users in medicine of acronyms. Um, there are other countries where you're not allowed to use any. But is, is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah I'm yeah, told yeah. South Africa, it's <laughs> illegal to use the vast majority of acronyms that we use here on a daily right? basis. I'm fascinated to hear that. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. So yeah. 
uh, we want to try and avoid that use as possible and I've got some ideals on how we can address that coming up in a moment. Any comments on, on these points? Yeah, I agree with all of that, Andrew. I think that's well said. Uh, certainly, it is important for us to be explicit. I think sometimes we, you know, we make an assessment, which is an implicit assessment on assumed knowledge. You know, yeah. We just assume that, okay, people would know these things. But the reality is, as you said, you know, when it is going to be quoted by someone external, you know, and who may or may not be privy to, you know, many of the things we do in intensive care, it is very important that, you know, we try to minimize that degree of difficulty which they might encounter, reduce all the information from the EMR. So we have been making a concerted effort and mm -hmm. I have to thank my staff in advance for that as well because it does take, you know, an added element of difficulty when they're documenting and mm. be cognizant of that. Another dynamic to consider. That's right, especially when they're, you know, task focused, they have to get on to a few other things. You know, it is important that they realize, and that's why I said earlier, it's a low-hanging fruit, you know. I think it's not difficult for us to say the patient is anemic. You know, we have this issue all the time, but just documenting a lab result and a plan is mm. not good enough. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So here's a, an example that I've put together. This is not a real patient uh, that I've had to de-identify. I've just pulled this out from my experience and observation. It's very easy to have the traditional way that we're a bit time poor, mm. try and write things quickly, particularly when we're on paper. Mm. You just want to avoid mm. that repetitive strain injury, so yeah. you write things quickly easier to write things like pneumonia with multi-organ failure. Now, multi-organ failure, obviously a problem that we are well versed with in critical mm -hmm. care. This is one of the best places for those patients to be treated. Multi-organ failure cannot be coded. It doesn't accurately reflect from a coding and documentation and diagnostic level what's actually happening with that patient. So one of the first things you'll see is that instead of writing multi-organ failure and then naming nasal high flow and NORAD, which is a plan without a specific link. Mm. We've actually then broken that down and said community acquired pneumonia, very specific. Then the complications, which are type one respiratory failure due to community acquired pneumonia, requiring CPAP or high flow, septic shock due to pneumonia, requiring vasopressor support, acute kidney injury due to shock with hyperkalemia requiring dialysis. Even though it takes a bit more time to put that out in full, once it's there, you've really we've already maximized this particular uh, complexity for this patient just by that list there. Mm. And you can see as well with the plan, like we talked about before, being relational and being specific and linking the different interventions to the many different issues that this patient is suffering from is really important so everyone's on the same page. So not just one times RBC, which is potentially open to interpretation if you don't know what RBC is, but transfusing red cells for anemia due to sepsis, really clear, couldn't improve more on that continue dialysis like the deceased tomorrow and you can see on the dialysis we often commence dialysis in ICU but we often don't actually say what the indication was and most commonly it's going to be fluid overload and hyperkalemia would you say? Yeah absolutely Andrew I think there is a lot of uh, fringe benefits I call it uh, by doing proper documentation it's one thing in terms of maximizing you know the revenues as part of the activity based funding model but even otherwise I think we work as a team and we you know a patient will be having three or four teams visiting you know, in intensive mm. care and for them it is actually good to see this level of documentation so that they know exactly what is happening for the patient so they don't have to wonder as to why this patient got transfused you know because we are very very explicit this was for that reason yeah okay and I think in that way it is actually good clinical practice and we need to embed this because it forms part of good clinical practice it is actually giving us a proper thought process in terms of managing a patient mm. and at the same time a thought process is again explicit for anyone to see and for everyone to actually take notice of it mm. so that you know we don't have to explain things to even the other teams say for example if you have a hematology yeah. patient in intensive care and we're documenting this then it is easy for you guys when you come and review a patient in the ICU yeah so it actually has benefits in many ways than just one yeah, yeah. I agree and particularly for a home team that might be looking after a patient after they've left you a good care, yeah. often retrospectively, it can be a bit challenging without good documentation to understand the patient journey mm. and understand the reasons why certain things were required. So it might be they had pneumonia, they went to intensive care for three days, they came out. It, I don't want to have to go back and read every single note to get the picture. I'd mm. love to have a summary or be able to look at a ward round note that has this kind of list that I can really see. Mm. They came here because they were septic with shock, with type 1 respiratory failure, and then eventually had some dialysis from hyperkalemia. Mm. It's just really easy to capture that um, very concisely and very clearly. And it's really helpful, not just for coding, but for all of our colleagues as we work together for the yeah. betterment of these patients. So we love acronyms in medicine in Australia and abbreviations, but they are often difficult to code and they're often difficult to interpret. Mm. 
And so you can actually use, if you're working in South Australia or you're working with some of the other ones like Epic and Cerner uh, interstate or overseas, um, they all allow things like acronym expansions or smart text. And so if you're using these a lot and it's, it's fascinating to look through maybe your colleagues documentation and realize just how many acronyms are there, some of which you might even not even know what they mean. Uh, fortunately, working in intensive care, I've got a good grasp of what most of these mean. I just picked some common ones here, but some of them I had to look up because I wasn't entirely sure. Well, I think you were in good company, Andrew, because yeah. the last one there, WWP, I haven't, you know, heard I of that. I had to look that one up. <laughs> then I, then I felt warm, a bit silly that it looks so simple. Warm and well perfused. Uh, look, I'm I'm bemused by that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there's some classic ones there, like mm. CVVHD. If you're not working in a um, critical care environment regularly, you might not be very aware of that because it's such a critical care specific type thing um, and even things like intracranial pressure if you're not used to working in a neurosurge environment which I wasn't having worked at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital prior um, that's something I, you know, I have to think about and they go oh it's probably intracranial pressure mm. but some of these things uh, you can automate them so I'm not even asking you to change your habit necessarily mm. you, except for whenever you write multi-organ failure you have to write which organs are failing uh, you can actually just put the acronym expansion in and it will just happen automatically so that's a really easy win right there yeah just following on from what i said at the beginning of the presentation that we are a final common pathway for various specialities so you know, if you have a neurosurgical patient the neurosurgical lingua franca always uses tbi mm -hmm. icp monitoring yeah you know and all of that and we would, the other thing we would say is btf guidelines you know so it's brain trauma foundation guidelines wouldn't have known that one <laughs> yeah so so these things happen so as a consequence what happens is that is usually a follow-on effect when they come to intensive mm -hmm. care we continue with that as well so you know i take your point i think we need to avoid using acronyms because it's a patient safety risk beyond anything else but at the same time, you need to have a whole of hospital approach as well towards this. And I'm yeah. sure, you know, as part of this coding education, we are undertaking that body of work. Yeah, yeah. even like we were talking about TBI before, yeah. traumatic brain injury for yeah. you, yeah. total body irradiation for me, <laughs> hematology, yeah. very different conditions. Yeah. yeah, serious conditions, but very different. Very different, yeah. yeah. In summary, today we've covered some specifics around intensive care, and I'd say probably the biggest thing there is uh, trying to avoid multi-organ failure and specifying mm what the organ failure is and um, subtyping that and the interventions associated. Avoiding acronyms and abbreviations and you can use your electronic medical record to automate that stuff so you don't have to change most of your habits there. Uh, applying the principles which you've seen again and again in the examples of being explicit, being specific, relating the conditions to each other and to interventions and being really clear by avoiding those acronyms and abbreviations. So thank you very much for joining me, Krish. Any last closing comments that you wanted to make? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think it's been a great journey with the scoring team and uh, learning along the way. Apart from all we've spoken about, I think the fundamental premise still remains that this is actually a safety and quality issue. Mm. And when I say that as safety and quality, the way I look at it is safety is doing the wrong things less often and quality is doing the right things more often. I like that. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So, you know, the quality here is like, you know, due to, you know, being explicit, being yeah. specific, you know, and trying to create that connection, that being relational. All of that is actually good things and we should do more often. Yeah. And that is a good quality initiative. In terms of the safety issues, I think we can see that if you're not going to be documenting properly, we can actually put patient safety at risk. Absolutely. And that's the most important thing for us to take uh, home as a message. And yeah, I think we'll continue to you know foster this good practice. And once again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thank you.